Well, I'm so honored to, to be able to introduce Brad today. It was right at about 10 years ago that many of us in the preservation community first got to know and to work with Brad Vogel. And all of us who have know how very special he is and how lucky we are. We met Brad when he came to study law at Tulane Law School, where he graduated cum laude in 2010. While at Tulane, he served as editor-in-chief of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal and continues to serve as a mentor to journal members, even squeezing in time on this trip. <laughs> as a member of the New York Bar, Brad worked in the Hong Kong and New York City offices of the global British firm Clifford Chance and rounded out more than six years of practicing law with a focus on transactional finance law at the firm of Thompson Hine. And that's just his law world. Long before coming to New Orleans, his early love for history led him to serve on the board of his hometown historical society in Keele, Wisconsin, while in high school. He became the sidekick of the town historian Ed Mackerzak. Once in New Orleans, his interest in historic preservation continued. While in law school, he, he worked to save one of the buildings on Tulane campus and started to follow the ongoings of the fight to save Charity Hospital in the lower Mid-City neighborhood. In 2009, he began to document the footprint of the proposed hospital in the lower, hosp lower Mid-City on his blog, Inside the Footprint, and it's still in use today as a major resource of fact-finding. His blogging led him to meet a host of local preservationists, and he quickly turned from a mere documentarian to an ardent advocate. These connections led him to spend a year working as the Ed Mackerzak <laughs> Historic Preservation Fellow for the National Trust for Historic <coughs> Preservation. In that role, Brad fought alongside Louisiana Landmark Society and others in many citywide manners. Brad led the movement to save and move for Rep's 1878 McDonough's 11 school building, the SW Green Mansion, and a number of other buildings, many of which have been included on Louisiana Landmark Society's list of nine most endangered sites. And sadly, many remain at risk today, but they were saved. Brad documented all the historic houses being displaced by the medical center. He worked to minimize damage to historic resources in the early days of the city's blight blitz by tailoring blight policy. He also assisted the National Trust in the amicus curiae brief in the Cabrini Church case. Before he left, Brad was named Preservationist of the Year in 2011 by the statewide organization, Louisiana Trust for Historic Preservation. In his short time in New Orleans, Brad became living proof that one person can make a big difference, particularly in post-Katrina New Orleans. After moving to New York, he began to begin his legal career. Preservationist Roberta Gratz wove Brad into the preservation network there. He served on the board of the New York Preservation Archive Project for over five years and provided pro bono legal advice for the Far Rock Rockaway Beach Bungalow Preservatory. Just last year, Brad followed his preservation path, leaving the practice of law to become the executive director of the New York Preservation Archive Project. And just to fill in all, some of his spare time, he's currently heading up efforts <laughs> to landmark sites in, in his neighborhood of Gowanus, Brooklyn, and is leading the ongoing effort to landmark the Brooklyn house where Walt Whitman lived when he wrote Leaves of Grass the only one left in over 30, re 30 Whitman residences in New York City. He also serves on the board of the Waltman, Walt Whitman Initiative. Louisiana Landmark Society is so pleased to welcome Brad back to New Orleans as part of the na nationwide celebration of Walt Whitman's 200th birthday to tell us the part New Orleans played in the history of Walt Whitman and his work. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Sandra. I was hoping she was going to give the one time around Audubon Park version of that intro, <laughs> but I guess we got a little bit more exercise. I saw in Louisiana a live oak growing. I saw in Louisiana a live oak growing. All alone stood it, and the moss hung down from the branches. Without any companion, it grew there, uttering joyous leaves of dark green, and its look rude, unbending, lusty, 
made me think of myself. But I wondered how it could utter joyous leaves standing alone there without its friend near, for I knew I could not. And I broke off a twig with a certain number of leaves upon it and twined it round with a little moss and brought it away, and I have placed it in sight in my room. It is not needed to remind me as of my own dear friends, for I believe lately I think of little else than of them. Yet it remains to me a curious token. It makes me think of manly love for all that. And though the live oak glistens there in Louisiana, solitary in a wide flat space, uttering joyous leaves all its life without a friend, a lover near, I know very well I could not. And so many of you may have heard that poem or read it, or read it many times or heard it many times going years back. But today I want to take you a little bit deeper and to dive in and see that this poem alone is not the only thing that ties Walt Whitman to New Orleans. It's been a joy to be here uh, these last few days, and I had a chance actually to go down to the historic New Orleans collection and do a little bit of last minute research, diving into some old newspapers from the 1840s. And I'll tell you at the end of the lecture, one of the things that I found, which was not something I expected to find, and which I think I was telling Roberta Gratz earlier, might just be pretty interesting for uh, scholars or anyone who follows Walt Whitman. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But basically, as Sandra said, this is the 200th birthday for Walt Whitman in, in 2019. He was born on May 31st, 1819 in Huntington, Long Island. And so you can see up here a list of all the different organizations across the country that have programming this year specifically meant to celebrate the bicentennial. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Louisiana Landmarks for making New Orleans part of this nationwide celebration and putting New Orleans on the map. So thank you. So let's talk about this, this time. Walt Whitman was only in New Orleans for about three months. So how in the world could it be that pivotal? What in the world could you do in three months that would make that much of a difference? What do you, when you think of Walt Whitman, besides that poem that I read earlier, what do you think of? Any particular poems that come to mind? When Lilacs Last and the Dooryard Bloom. Oh, Captain, My Captain, you may have heard of. And then Leaves of Grass, you might have heard of it. <laughs> probably the most famous work of poetry in American history. And if you remember, Walt Whitman, he issues Leaves of Grass in 1855, and then he reissues it multiple times over, and he's constantly growing it. It grows from a few poems to hundreds of poems, and eventually, in 1892 or 1891-92, you have what's called the deathbed version, and it's gone from a few poems to basically a Bible. So how does he get there, though? How does he come out of nowhere and become this person who had been a school teacher out in the sticks on Long Island? He'd been sort of a, a printer working here and there, a journalist. How does he go from that to becoming the most famous poet in the country? I'm here to tell you and to posit that New Orleans <coughs> was utterly pivotal in that transformation of Walt Actually, it was, we'll see here. This is probably, you'll probably see this big bearded, almost Father Time looking figure. It's the later Whitman from the 1880s, 1890s. And over here, you have this, this rather, I don't know, what would you say, a sort of come hither look. Hands, <laughs> hands on hips with the shirt unbuttoned. And as Whitman himself called himself, one of the roughs. But this is not, this is not, I repeat, neither of these are the Whitman who comes to New Orleans in February of 1848. It's a much different character who arrives here. But when he leaves, 
he is on his way most decidedly towards becoming first this character and then in time that character. This is not actually a description of tonight's event, I would just like to say. <laughs> Michael's actually calling for that up here, so I better, I better watch myself. But I just want to give you a sense of Whitman, he's working for Brooklyn newspapers, and he loses his job. It's, it's hard to tell whether he really resigned or he was forced out, but let's just say he didn't agree with the politics of the people running the paper he was working for. So this is him quoting directly. Being now out of a job, I was offered impromptu. It happened between the acts one night in the lobby of the old Broadway theater near Pearl Street, New York City. A good chance to go down to New Orleans on the staff of The Crescent, a daily to be started there with plenty of capital behind it. One of the owners who was north buying material met me walking in the lobby. And though that was our first acquaintance, after 15 minutes talk and a drink, we made a formal bargain. And he paid me $200 down to bind the contract and bear my expenses to New Orleans. I started two days afterwards, had a good leisurely time as the paper wasn't to be out in three weeks. I enjoyed my journey and Louisiana life much. So this is 1848, you have to take yourself back. We are back before World War II. We are back before the turn of the century. We are back before the Civil War, 1848. It takes him from, he goes with his little brother, Jeff, Thomas Jefferson Whitman. And here you, you see in the middle, a sort of comic book cutout from the 50s that puts a little bit of a leave it to beaver spin on the Whitman mythos. But here he's talking with Jeff. And basically, Jeff is only 14 at the time. Whitman himself is only 28. And they start off on a two-week journey. They head down to Baltimore. And from Baltimore, they have to take the train out to Cumberland. And at Cumberland, Maryland, it's really interesting to read Whitman's description of this trip because basically he's seeing all of these, what he calls Pennsylvania wagons, thousands of them marshalling there. Because if you remember 1848, what else is going on? Well, not yet the gold rush, but the Oregon Trail. So everyone heading west to the Oregon Territory, that's been underway for a number of years, but he's literally seeing these masses of wagons and all these settlers preparing to head west. Uh, he also goes through a place that would later figure in history pretty prominently, Harper's Ferry. Uh, also the site later of the, the whole episode with John Brown. But from there, they get as far as they can, and then what do they do? They hop on a steamboat, and they head down the Ohio, and then further down the Mississippi. And over on the side there, you can see a list of just a brief sense of the crazy amount of activity on the Mississippi at the time. Those are just steamboats coming in in one day to New Orleans. Um, and he, Whitman talks in this rather blurry quote here about night now falling down around us like a very large cloak of black broadcloth. I fancy that figure at least hasn't been used up by the poets. And the Alleghenies rearing themselves up some pumpkins, as they say here, right before our nasal passages. So you can see in his description that he publishes when he arrives in New Orleans, this little foretaste of Whitman the poet. He's coming up with this sense that when he swings out into America on his way to New Orleans, he's encountering sort of the real deal, the real voice of America, um, saying, you know, no fancy European poet would, would compare something beautiful to broadcloth, something that you can get at the general store. So he's, he's taking poetry out of its ivory tower, out of its fancy perch, and he's bringing it down among the people. He also, and the, the last little tidbit over here, this is not something I expect you'd be able to read in the back, certainly, or even up front, <laughs> but he also talks about all the drovers, the men who are driving the wagons, the stagecoaches during some of these stops. And he recounts sitting and watching these men around the fireplace in this Allegheny Inn. Um, so you also see another theme that comes up in Whitman. This, this eye that is always on the lookout for somebody who might be 
a friend. And I, I guess I want to stop here and say, Walt Whitman today, many people associate him with the LGBT movement. And if you read his poetry, it's certainly clear that he was probably something other than what we would call today straight. But you have to remember that the term homosexual did not actually come into use in the modern, modern centuries until after Whitman's time in New Orleans. So part of what makes Whitman's poetry unique is that he doesn't really even have a very clear framework for how to express something other than than uh, how to express same-sex desire. So this is a poem that he writes as he's coming in on the steamboat into New Orleans, the Mississippi at midnight. And when Whitman arrives, he and Jeff actually have to stay on the steamboat overnight while Whitman goes out the next day looking for lodgings in this hustling, bustling city. And so you can see that this poem is a little bit more traditional than what you come to see in Leaves of Grass, because Whitman's Leaves of Grass really breaks with the old, the old European forms, where you, when you think of poetry, you might think of rhyme, you might think of meter, the things that many people think of as poetry. Whitman blows that out of the water and says, I'm not going to have rhyme. I'm not going to have meter. I'm not going to use highfalutin language. I am going to absorb things from daily living and come up with a whole new American voice. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, the poet, basically recognizes Whitman as, you are the one I've been calling for. I've been waiting for somebody to break with all these old traditions and come up with a uniquely American voice. And Whitman is pretty excited to get that news. And when he first publishes Leaves of Grass, he gets a letter from Emerson and in that, in that letter, it says, I greet you at the beginning of a great career. Without asking Emerson or getting any kind of permission, Whitman, for his next edition, takes that, doesn't print it just on the back like someone might today. He prints it on the spine of the book. <laughs> <laughs> but Whitman was, a, was an interesting and crafty marketer. He, would, he even wrote negative reviews anonymously of his own book, put them out into circulation to stir up controversy. <laughs> so I don't know if certain people in modern times are, are learning tricks from Walt himself. So they arrive February, late February, February 25th of 1848. And February, so when is he arriving? Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. So he arrives in the city on the eve of Mardi Gras, and the first edition of the newspaper, he spends, he spends uh, the 26th, I guess, to March 4th in a boarding house on Poydras Street. And this is, if you think of where One Shell Square is today, basically catty corner from that, there were a row of three old wooden houses, and that's where he and Jeff first land. But let me just give you, let's skip out of order here, and give you a little taste of what Jeff, in one of his letters home, says about this, these new lodgings. Let's see here. I'll tell you this much, it's not complimentary. <laughs> you could not only see the dirt, but you could taste it. And you had to, too, if you ate anything at all, he said. And the rooms, too, were covered in dirt an inch thick. So this, of course, you have to remember, this is Poydras in St. Charles, 1848. You have every possible contrivance known to mankind at the time going up and down the street. And Whitman himself reports that it's incredibly loud living there. But they move to another boarding house that's a little bit, a little bit more high class, the Tremont House, which is just across. Also, basically their node when they're in New Orleans, Jeff and Walt, is on St. Charles between Poydras and Canal. That was the heart of the city at the time, at least for the American sector, um, the Faubourg St. Mary. So ultimately, this is the first edition of the Daily Crescent. This is the paper that Walt has been contracted to come down and help start. And it's a daily, and it rapidly takes off. At the time, there's also the Delta and the Picayune operating in the city as a daily. 
But the, the unique angle of the Daily Crescent is they promise to get you the news from all the Northeastern newspapers. So they have exchanges with them where part of Walt's job is literally to clip things out of those other papers and put them in to this paper. So you can see it's this rather broad sheet. And they're talking about, what are they talking about 1848? They're talking about the Mexican-American War, which is going on. And New Orleans was really the entrepot for everything going in and out of the US to Mexico. Um, they also, I think in this first edition, or certainly the, the next day, they have a correspondent whose nickname was, or pen name was Chaparral, who is reporting on all the activity in Mexico. So like I said, Mardi Gras that, that year, they publish their first edition on a Sunday, oddly enough. Basically, today we'd call it Bacchus Sunday. And they, then Mardi Gras is two days, later on, two days later on the 7th. And I'll just read you a little bit of a report here on what that was all about. Yesterday was the famous day for those who wish to see the colors of the rainbow in streets and squares. And then later on they, go on, they go down to, they basically say that it's, it's some, of, some of the slang that I encountered when I was reading this paper is going to take years to figure out precisely what it means. Um, but ultimately they, talk, they go on to talk about people throwing powder in other people's face. That apparently was sort of the gig at the time. And if you recall, the Mardi Gras parades in New Orleans really had only started in a formal way as about 1837 in some, some sense. Um, so this is still pre-1872 when Mardi Gras really takes off with a big formal cruise. Um, they also report the next day that there had only been, uh, I think, 12 fights. So they thought that it was a, a very proper day. Um, Yes, so the, the quote is, in a very handsome manner and upon our conscience, we do not believe that more than a dozen fights took place. And Jeff, when he writes home to his parents, says, there has been two or three processions and one thing or another days since we have been here and some rather funny ones too. So you have to recall, Whitman himself rarely ever traveled outside of New York. When you read his poetry, you think this man must have traveled around the world. He has this sort of universal sense of humanity's experience. He basically left for three months to New Orleans. <laughs> Otherwise, he spent his time in New York and on Long Island. And late in life, he makes one little trip to Boston to oversee publication, he makes a little trip to Canada, and one very last trip out to Denver. But beyond that, he's really, a lot of his poetry comes from the time he spent getting to New Orleans and the time for him to get back from New Orleans. <laughs> This is also, um, this is, I just thought this was a fantastic description of what was happening with the courts at the time. And this might sound familiar to some, I know we have a few lawyers in the room. So there was a big fireman's parade right during the Mardi Gras season. And, and the paper says, yesterday being the anniversary of the fireman's department, nothing of importance was transacted in any of the higher courts or even in the police offices. Dame Justice seemed to be under the influence of chloroform, <laughs> and her hair swerved not the particle of a hair. Tomorrow, blessed tomorrow, the blue Monday of those who were blue the day before will give Dame Justice a chance to retrieve her reputation. And so the Daily Crescent had this, this personality. It was, it was reporting the news, but it, was also, it also had a perspective on things that was enmeshed in the local life of the city at the time. This is another thing you have to remember that they're dependent on telegrams and dispatches at the time to create the news. So that creates some problems sometimes. Here they publish, query, is there any city in the union except one where an important and large mail bringing nearly three weeks later intelligence from a scene of operations to which the attention of the whole land is earnestly directed and other lands too, where such a mail would be brought up to a bar room at half past 3 p.m., no one to receive it, the ship's officer mounting guard over it till six o'clock, then it being taken into the post office proper, but not assorted or distributed till the next day, not even to the newspaper editors. 
So they're dealing with this crazy system of communications and trying to put out a daily newspaper. But ultimately, we've talked a little bit about their lodgings already, but you have to look over here on the side to see what was this newspaper all about. The front page had a few headlines, but a lot of it was advertisements. And so you have things like sperm oil from sperm whales. You have screws for pressing tobacco um, and cotton, uh, guns and pistols. Uh, oftentimes, also, there were several different dentists who advertised new methods. So you, this was a working paper, um, not a, an intellectual high, high point. Um, Walt, though, really seemed to like New Orleans. And he says, my health was most capital. I frequently thought, indeed, that I felt better than ever before in my life. And after changing my boarding house, Jeff and I were, take it all together, pretty comfortable. We had good beds, and though the noise was incessant, day and night we slept well. The plan of going to dinner when we liked and calling for what we wanted out of a variety of dishes was more convenient than the usual way of boarding houses. And so it's a very subtle point, but it's one that continues to crop up in everything we see from Whitman was he was being exposed to totally different ways of life. And that's really important when we come back to his poetry later. He is encountering things he's never seen before, ways of, things as simple as how you eat, how you go about your business. Um, this crops up also when you look at how business was conducted in the city at the time. You had these huge exchange hotels, the St. Charles Exchange Hotel and the St. Louis Exchange Hotel in the quarter, one being for the Americans, one being for the Creoles down in the quarter. But business would be conducted in these huge hotels. Um, and you can see that Whitman is sort of loitering around, seeing what's going on, having little meetings with people, and weaving himself into the city. You also have um, things just, lots of things going on. So you have a balloon ascent that was supposed to take place, and Jeff writes home to his parents, uh, seemingly very entranced by this, um, where apparently there was, the thing was tried four or five times. But as just enough persons got inside, the thing would manage to burst. A few Sundays ago, it was said it would go up again. They got it all ready when it blew all to pieces. The persons that paid to see it thought it was nothing but a suck in, which I think it was. As soon as it touched the ground, they all laid hold of it and dragging over the fence, tore it all to pieces. They did not leave a piece, did not leave a piece or a square foot. So ended all that. But you also see in the paper all these different things going on. Tom Thumb is performing at the St. Charles Theater at the time. Uh, Whitman defends uh, Dr. Collier's uh, Young Artist, which is this performance that involved nude recreations of different scenes like Adam and Eve or the Venus arising from the scene. And Whitman, of course, jumps in thinking that he has to defend this. But it's, it's then indicated that most of the people in New Orleans are, this is, this is old hat. <laughs> <laughs> You also see down in the bottom here, there's, and it's again a little hard to see, but there's a reference to Egyptian archaeological lectures. There's all these different things percolating in the city at the time, and several scholars see Egyptian themes cropping up in Whitman's poetry, and they all, from what I've read, attribute it to a museum he visited in New York in the 1850s. It didn't open until the early 1850s. Well, what I found looking through the Daily Crescent here, and this is, not, this is not the big news that I was mentioning earlier, but a little tidbit of interesting news is I think he actually picked up his interest in Egyptology and things Egyptian in New Orleans because you have this little ad here, and then he ultimately uh, reports on that event and seems to be very excited about it. Um, but let's go on and just... Take a look. Egyptian revival. Now, this is, this is not the whole topic I want to talk about right now, but it's a good example of it. Everyone knows what this is. New Orleans has an insectarium. <laughs> but yes, the Custom House down on Canal. And the Custom House started construction 1848. 
the year that Whitman is in town. And if you know, up top here you have these lotus capitals because Egyptian revival was all the rage at the time. And if anyone goes down Rousseau Street, back behind the Chop Walmart, that's where the, the den for the Knights of Babylon is actually in a really interesting old Egyptian revival building. So check that out sometime. It's still there and you can still see some of the details. But Whitman, Whitman at this time, he and Jeff are going all over the city. Basically, Whitman says he acquired a saunterer's knowledge of New Orleans. So they would go out on the Shell Road, which ran along the New Basin Canal. So that was, you might know where the Lafitte Greenway is, and there was the Old Basin Canal that came in from the lake. But there was also the New Basin Canal that came in along the route of what is today the Pontchartrain Expressway, and it ended around where Union Station is. So Jeff reports, we took a very long walk last night, way out Camp Street, beyond the city limits. There are no hills like on Old Long Island. The whole state is as level as a race course. In some of the streets, they have a kind of canal or drain to let the water run off. And even then, in some places, there is not enough downhill to make it run off good. Just a little further uptown, there is a canal of a larger kind than those in the middle of the street, where sloops, etc., can come up from the lake. Along by this canal, there is a road called Shell Road where we take frequent and very pleasant walks. The road is nearly as hard as a brick, and on pleasant afternoons it is covered with carriages of every description. It seems to be the fashion to drive your horse as fast as he can go. They also go down and take a look at St. Louis No. 1, and they note that there are flowers all over that cemetery. They go and look at the Place Arms, or the public square, which we know today as Jackson Square. And if you recall, 1848, the Baroness Pontalba is only just arriving because of the revolutions in Europe. And so they haven't built the two flanking Pontalba apartment buildings. Also, the cathedral has not been redone. So Jeff describes it as looking very, very old because at that point it was very, very old, and they only started the reconstruction of that in 1850, two years later. Um, but again, just a little more context. The Cabildo at this point is about 50 years old, but it doesn't ha have its third floor mansard roof. Gallier Hall was under construction across the time that they were in the city. Um, and you also had some markets that today we sometimes forget, like the St. Mary's Market, which was near where the convention center is today. You also have to look at a little bit more context. Who were the presidents that were in the mix at this time? It's a bunch of presidents, and I'll mention them because it's President's Day weekend. <laughs> presidents that you rarely hear from. So one of the main things that crops up in the first editions of the Daily Crescent is a lot of talk about John Quincy Adams because he had just passed away. So you see that he was the sixth president. And then Zachary Taylor, the 12th president, hero of the Mexican-American War, old rough and ready, actually shows up in New Orleans while Whitman is working as a reporter. Um, so he goes to the theater, the lights come up, the band plays Hail Columbia, and there's Zachary Taylor very likely candidate for president, and Whitman does not seem to be impressed at all. Showed the least of conventional ceremony or etiquette I ever saw. He laughed unrestrainedly at everything comical. He also actually had a chance to talk with him prior to this, this session at the theater, and again, did not think very much of Zachary Taylor. Um, and if you're up in Baton Rouge, you may have seen some of the signs because Zachary Taylor actually owned a plantation in what is now Baton Rouge. You also have Martin Van Buren, and I mention him because he's associated with all kinds of crazy political terms at the time that you see crop up in the paper. Free soilers, barn burners, loco focos, and wigs. <laughs> I won't get into all that, that's for another day. But one of the things that does happen is Sometime during these three months that Whitman is working for the newspaper, the two owners suddenly go from being really, really nice to him to seeming strangely cold. And Whitman can't quite figure out what that is. Um, but ultimately, a lot of scholars speculate that it's because Whitman has 
what at the time was called free soil tendencies, which meant that he basically opposed the extension of slavery into the new territories out west, that that was probably part of the story that led to this friction between him and the owners of the paper. So Jeff, I feel like the letters that he wrote back home are really our best glimpse into the time in New Orleans. Um, this is not Jeff when he's 14, by the way, uh, just to be clear. <laughs> He actually ends up in St. Louis, Missouri, which is a place that Whitman and Jeff stop on their way down to New Orleans. So that's him later in life. But he reports that the two of them love to go to the new park just around the corner. And well, Lafayette Square was not actually a new park. It was just redone at the time. Uh, they did enjoy walking around in the park. And that was actually the site, from what I can tell, of that balloon ascent I mentioned earlier. But this, again, is just around the corner from where they lived. It's just around the corner from the theater, just around the corner from the newspaper offices, the gigantic St. Charles Hotel, which you saw in an earlier slide. So this is all right in the hub of things. But what is Whitman himself doing? He is working at the newspaper. He says he gets home usually around 11, which is earlier than he thought, because you have to remember, at this time, we're working with type that has to be set. There's a lot of work involved with it. So ultimately, Jeff, Whitman's younger brother, it's clear from every letter that he writes home that he is very, very homesick. Really, really homesick. It's also clear that he's actually sick. Um, and if you remember, in, 18, in the 1840s in New Orleans, the water system has not really been figured out. And so the yellow fever was a very real problem. He writes home trying to reassure his parents that the yellow fever visited last year, 1847. Only 2,500 people died. And from what we know, if it strikes hard in one year, it probably won't come back all that much in the next year. He also then notes way down at the very end of that letter, oh yes, and also I have a mild case of dysentery. And I still have summer complaints. Um, and so he's trying to reassure his parents back home that he doesn't have yellow fever, but basically has to admit that he is sick on an ongoing basis in New Orleans. So all of this, you have to start looking at why is Whitman only in New Orleans for three months? That's probably part of the story, but there are other factors that we'll get to. Um, Whitman starts going out into the streets. He is, he starts this little series in the newspaper called Sketches of the Sidewalks and Levees with glimpses into the New Orleans bar rooms. And he does these little sketches of people who are out on the streets. It's clear that he's going down by the wharves. He's going down in the areas where there's prostitution. He is going in the less than desirable parts of town and checking them out. And I think as someone who's coming from New York, who again has not traveled all that much, he had a Quaker background, he is seeing all kinds of things. And you know, for, for me, I found that very interesting because I, too, came from the north and found all kinds of things in New Orleans. And I'm very glad for it, I must say. <laughs> so let's see if we can pull this up. But it is the things that Whitman sees when he is out in the streets, when he's in the hotels, seeing business conducted, that really changes his poetry. It changes him. And you probably know that in a lot of these hotels, under the big main rotunda, that was often where slaves were auctioned. And so a lot of the scholars, when they look at New Orleans, they say, Whitman is going down, and he's entering a place where slavery is part of the norm. What many of them forget is that in New York, 1827, years after Whitman is born, is actually first when slaves are emancipated and slavery ends in New York State. There was northern slavery. Um, so that's a part of it. I don't know that it was quite as novel for Whitman to encounter as some people make it out. But I think the full scope of it, the fact that he's seeing this now as an adult, um, I do think it, it makes a difference. Let's get this out of the way. He 
He also, um, he's also got that, those eyes looking around that I mentioned earlier. This is him going to St. Mary's Market. Saw a man, a good man, in a blue jacket and cottonade pantaloons with a long stick of sugar cane in his hand. Wondered who he was, and was much surprised to find that he was a lawyer of some repute. At the lower end of the market, there was a woman with a basket of live crabs on, at her feet. And then he talks about also going to get the mysterious donuts at the French market. <laughs> especially of a Sunday, and these are his words, especially of a Sunday morning, the show was a varied and curious one. Among the rest, the Indian and Negro hucksters with their wares, I remember, I nearly always on these occasions got a large cup of delicious coffee with a biscuit for my breakfast from the immense shining copper kettle of a great Creole mulatto woman. I never have had such coffee since. So he also writes these quasi-fictional accounts of people, uh, these little vignettes or sketches, and they have some great names. I honestly think it would be great for a, a, a parading crew to, to do these as floats. Dagger Draw Bowie Knife Esquire. <laughs> Timothy Goujon V-O-N-O, -O, vendor of oysters in New Orleans. John J. Jinglebrain. Samuel Sensitive, who's a jilted lover, by the way, and Miss Dusky Grisette. So he's going out, and you can see in some of these accounts that he is, he is there mingling with people that the newspapers at the time probably wouldn't otherwise really con be concerning themselves with. And this again goes to Whitman's poetry, because poetry up until Whitman is people like Emerson who live in a manse people who have a much more formal and very acceptable and proper take on poetry. And Whitman basically goes down in the gutter, but says everybody matters. In the American story, it's going to be a much broader and, sorry to tell you, a little bit dirtier tableau if we're going to get this whole thing down in poetry. So this is, goes back to the yellow fever. The other part of the yellow fever story is Whenever Jeff is writing home, he's always talking about drinking and temperance. And Whitman actually wrote a novel prior to this that was called Franklin Evans or The Inebriate. And it was all about the dangers of drinking. And Whitman himself was really part of the temperance movement. And you'll see in the Daily Crescent when you dig into it, they literally list all of these chapters of the new temperance organization that's sweeping the states. And they're really pushing it hard. And basically, Jeff says, you need not be alarmed about the yellow fever, yada, yada, yada. Besides, it is a great humbug most everyone in our office has had. Some of them have had it twice and got well. It is caused mostly, I think, all of it by the habits of the people. They never meet a friend, but you have to go drink and such loose habits. You know that Walter is averse to such habits, so you need not be afraid of our taking it. But then Whitman himself um, says, now you know I am not ultra in these matters, but it isn't good to drink spiritous compounds at this rate in hot climates. <laughs> but let's get on to, I was mentioning earlier, the slave auctions. And that is one of the central things that we have to keep in mind when we're thinking about Whitman's transformation in New Orleans. So I've talked about all the many different people, the different ways of living, the, literally the different ways of eating that he has encountered, but it's the treatment of people and the relationships between human beings that really comes to... <laughs> <laughs> you should have paid the bill. It's a very, very secure presentation, <laughs> I assure you. <laughs> but Whitman does see slave auctions, and I wanted to read you just briefly a little bit from one of his poems. This is from I Sing the Body Electric. A man's body at auction, for before the war I often go to the slave market and watch the sale. I help the auctioneer, the sloven does not half know his business. Gentlemen, look on this wonder. Whatever the bids of the bidders, they cannot be high enough for it. 
For it the globe lay preparing quintillions of years without one animal or plant. For it the revolving cycles truly and steadily rolled. In this head, the all-baffling brain, in it and below it, the makings of heroes. Examine these limbs, red, black, or white. They are cunning in tendon and nerve. They shall be stripped that you may see them. Exquisite senses, life-lit eyes, pluck, volition, flakes of breast muscle, pliant backbone and neck, flesh not flabby, good-sized arms and legs, and wonders within there yet. Within there runs blood, the same old blood, the same red running blood. There swells and jets a heart, there all passions, desires, reachings, aspirations. And so Whitman, in his poetry, in Leaves of Grass, is seeing human beings as human beings. And I submit to you that his experience in New Orleans was crucial to making that discovery and making that connection. Um, it's also important because Whitman is very clearly not just the poet of the soul. A lot of the early American poetry, like William Cullen Bryant, is writing about these very ethereal topics and philosophical topics. Whitman retains that, but he adds the body. He is a very visceral poet. And I think, again, he saw in New Orleans that part of what makes us human is not just what's up here, but literally our bodies and our, the fact that we are all vulnerable, real human beings. And he weaves in a little bit of eroticism, too, because he's Walt Whitman. This is, again, from that same comic book, as Walt strolled the vivid streets. I'm learning something here. So it's kind of it's comical, but you can see that this comic artist has actually woven in a number of things. You have the soldiers there in the middle, because the city is filled with soldiers during the Mexican-American War. It ends, and they all come back through New Orleans, or many of them come back through New Orleans. Um, you have Native American presence. You have the ladies with flowers on their heads. This was something that both Whitman and Jeff comment all the times, is just the incredible profusion of flowers in the city and the flowers for sale all over the place. But it does seem to fail in the sense that it's not really actively portraying enslaved people, which was part of the experience of being in New Orleans at the time. Until 1852, um, when there was a slave auction, the, sla the enslaved people would usually be in what were called slave pens, but for auction purposes, they would be lined up on the sidewalks, literally out in the streets of the city where all the hustle and bustle was going on. So it's important to note that there have been places along the way that have looked at Whitman and really failed to fully see just how much, how, how viscerally slavery was woven into his experience here. Now I'd like to read just a very, very short poem, and, and don't even try to read this, please. I'm giving you progressively more difficult visual tasks. This one is called, Once I Passed Through a Populous City. Once I passed through a populous city, imprinting my brain for future use with its shows, architecture, customs, traditions. Yet now all of that city I can remember only a woman I casually met there who detained me for love of me. Day by day and night by night we were together. All else has long been forgotten by me. I remember, I say, only that woman who passionate, passionately clung to me. Again, we wander, we love, we separate again. Again, she holds me by the hand. I must not go. I see her close beside me with silent lips, sad and tremulous. So that's almost assuredly written about New Orleans from everything the scholars can tell. But I'd, this is from a later version of Leaves of Grass. I'd like you to take a look, don't try to read it, but just take a general look at what you see on the screen. That is the actual manuscript where Whitman wrote the poem out in his notebooks. And let's go to the next slide. What you find out is that in the manuscript, it wasn't a woman, it was a man. So if anyone needs to gasp or clutch their pearls, now is the moment. Yes. 
<laughs> surprise, surprise. So that was, I think this is at the core, the, the, the slavery aspect and the general broader scope of what life holds is part of it, but I think it really comes down to love and to attraction. And I really think that when he's thousands of miles away from home, he finally finds in this place where he has a bit of anonymity a chance to discover himself. And I, I think that is a very important part of the story. And to me, that explains how we go from someone who literally is known as Walter Whitman Jr. up until the time he arrives in the city. And after this, when he returns to New York, he starts to become Walt Whitman. He becomes the poet that we all know today because of the experiences in this city. At some point, the three month stint ends. Accordingly, on Friday, I packed up my traps. So what seems to happen is, as I mentioned earlier, the owners of the newspaper grow colder and colder. They just don't seem to be friendly anymore. Whitman, at, this is at the end of May. And Whitman says on May 24th, he asks them for an advance of funds, and they reject it. And then they go into sort of back and forth and discussions. And ultimately, he quits the next day or is forced out the next day. And by May 27th, he and Jeff are on a steamer heading north up the Mississippi out of, out of the city. But again, if you look through the records, it's rather interesting because Jeff actually says in a letter back home to the parents on April 23rd, Walter is trying to save up all the money he can get, and already he has quite a sum. As soon as he gets $1,000, he is coming north. Oh, interesting. And then he says, and I too am saving whatever I can get. I gave Walter $5 the other day, so he's doing the best he can. But I, I don't know. Is this Walt Whitman just telling his little very, very homesick and literally sick brother that I'm saving money, we're going to leave? Because it seems that Whitman, from everything I'm reading, actually loves New Orleans. He really seems to be physically healthier. He is enjoying all of this new terrain to explore. Um, but it's hard to tell whether this is actually him just having come down and he wanted to get the experience and the money and he just wanted to head back north. It doesn't seem like it to me. I think you also have to remember at this time, when does the yellow fever season begin? Just a few days or weeks after this particular moment in time. I think that was also big on his mind. He was thinking, my brother is already sick with other various ailments and we're coming up on yellow fever season. So it's, it's hard to tell if he actually made that request for an advance as almost an offer he knew they would refuse that could be a pretext to leave. Something I think that scholars should take a look at. But all that said, they head back north. So who is this person? Whitman now spends a number of years working in newspapers, but also, and a lot of people forget this, working with his family building homes in Brooklyn. It's a boom town at that point, and they are a small team moving from one house to the next, building it, living in part of it, selling it, moving into the next place. And that's where my current efforts in New York come in, because we are trying to save the last house. He lived in 30 different places across Brooklyn and Manhattan, and there's only one left. And it happens to be the house he lived in when he first published Leaves of Grass. So it's very important. And I feel like, you know, New Orleans, New Orleans has so many cultural threads woven into it that a three-month visit by Walt Whitman actually kind of just gets pushed by the wayside for the most part. Even Abe Lincoln coming down, it took Richard Campanella writing that book to really lift up that episode because New Orleans is so rich with stuff. Sometimes you lose something here, like Sidney Bachet's house in the Seventh Ward, which was back when I was here working for the National Trust. Um, but then you have things like the Jazz Plaque program that the PRC does and a lot of the efforts that Louisiana Landmarks undertakes to make sure that people know about important cultural heritage things. So I am hopeful that New York will take a lesson from this city and get on it and landmark this house in Brooklyn. 
But Whitman, during this time, he's working, but he's also formulating, he's reflecting on all of the things he met here. He also starts to hang out with a group in New York uh, that's really one of the first little bits of bohemia in America outside of New Orleans. Uh, they meet at a cellar on Broadway called Faf's or Fafs. And um, Gottschalk, one of the composers from here in New Orleans who did Bambula and some of the other things, is part of that little crew. Um, but that seems to be Whitman, if you ask me, that's Whitman trying to find that little tidbit of New Orleans in New York, this place where people can truly be themselves. They can be a little bit weird, and everyone's kind of OK with that. They enjoy the fact that people are truly idiosyncratic and not just a cookie cutter. Um, so all of that is tying in. He's reflecting on what I think is his newfound sexuality during this period. Uh, he's reflecting on race, certainly, because he goes back and starts a paper called The Free Soiler, where he's advocating for barring the extension of slavery out into the Western states. So all of that is churning, and that to me is how you get the Walt Whitman who is somehow, out of the blue, capable of writing Leaves of Grass, which is so unlike anything else he had written, or like unlike anyone else had written. So I want to get back to something that is quite exciting, actually, because as I was digging into the archives, I was looking for any little tidbit that I might pull out and talk about that had to do with Walt Whitman in the paper. You know, you remember that first poem that I had up here that he writes, Sailing on the Mississippi at Midnight? If you noted down at the bottom on that one, he signed it W period W period for Walt Whitman. After that, I couldn't really find anything that had that. So I thought, well, that's so weird. Whitman would probably want to be getting some credit knowing Walt, even if it's in a roundabout way. So I started looking at other clippings. And Walt Whitman wrote a bunch of different things over the course of his journalistic career under pseudonyms or pen names. And so I am very, 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 very curious to know who is Jack Waterways. It's pretty clearly a pen name or a pseudonym. And I think it's trying to speak for the common man, to speak for the guys working down on the wharves, the Conti Street wharves. And if you read this poem, it's all about longing, seeking a friend, having wandered through my youth without a connection to another human being. All these themes that come up in this little booklet that Whitman had written called Live Oak with Moss. Those were all poems about attraction that seem to date from the New Orleans period. He deconstructs that booklet. And a bunch of those poems crop up in what become the Calamus poems in one of his later editions of Leaves of Grass, which are the ones that are all about same-sex attraction. And so I think there's a chance, and I know there's at least one other Jack Waterways poem, I think there's a chance uh, that we might be on the verge of finding some new Walt Whitman poems, which would be really interesting. And so I'm very grateful to the Historic New Orleans Collection for having microfiche on, on hand on Thursday. But we'll continue to look into that. And I will definitely let Sandra know and let the Landmark Society know if we do, in fact, find some new poems as a result of this lecture, <laughs> really. So I would like to say a big thank you to many, many people who helped make this possible. Um, Sandra for coming up with the idea, and thank you again for letting me come down on Crew de Vue weekend. I appreciate it. <laughs> and to the society. Um, I'd also like to thank the Walt Whitman Initiative. This is, and the Walt Whitman, Whitman 2019 Consortium. These are two groups that are all devoted to celebrating this 200th anniversary of Whitman's birth. Um, and my good friend, Professor Karen Carpenter, who when I sent her this possibly new poem said, um, we need to talk about this. <laughs> um, and then the Historic New Orleans Collection, Susan Larson and WWNO, Tolan Brown, who put together a walking tour of some of the sites, the Walt Whitman Archive, which has been indispensable in all this, my friend Ed Centeno, who came up with the little comic book images from his collection, um, and then also the Purcells, who have been like a family to me here in New Orleans and have done so much for me. And 
I'm also getting to stay there for free, which made this thing possible as well. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you to everyone for coming tonight. It's been a joy to, to lift this moment up. Because like I said, amidst all the things flowing through New Orleans over all the centuries, it's nice to take this one little oyster shell and hold it up for an evening. Thank you. <laughs>
the reality of someone in a slave pen, I think, would have been off the charts, almost uncontrollable. And so I think that some people might see it as a, you know, just a fascination with the body, but I think it's a fascination with the body mixed with this incredible empathy that takes him on those visits. One more, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just give a sense, a little more of a sense of what he was doing at the Crescent? Mm -hmm. The two months of the Crescent, so he was the editor. So he was or, an or editor. Was, was he writing? Was he just signing? I mean, it was a very mm -hmm. small staff. Mm -hmm. so I would imagine much of what was in the paper was was had his mark. Right, absolutely, and it's it's hard because it's not, a lot of it is not signed. But yes, it was a very small staff, and it's important to note that he wasn't. It's not clear that he was the editor per se. He was one of the editors, and some some scholars say he's actually over glorified, and really all he was doing was reviewing these newspapers coming in, clipping out the relevant details. But it's pretty clear once you start digging in with a Whitmanic eye to this paper that a lot of the things that are being written are written through his voice. Um, some of those little ditties about the police courts being closed that are written in this strangely poetic manner, almost needlessly so, is classically Whitman, almost assuredly. But he's overseeing a staff, and I've got the notes here on who his staff was. Um, you, and you may have read that already somewhere online, but basically it's a staff of about three or four the owners themselves don't seem to be directly involved. Um, but one of the guys actually has a tie to Mozart's librettist. Um, so it's an interesting crew. One of the guys works translating all the things coming in from the Mexican front um, and doing sort of odd jobs. Jeff himself is helping around the newspaper office. And there's one tidbit that says that another aspect of why Whitman leaves is that the owners are making Jeff do work that is way beyond him as a 14-year-old that he that Walt considers dangerous or excessive. So it's a very small crew there on St. Charles, um, but they're nestled right in the thick of things with the theater, the the big exchange hotels, and the auction areas. You're done. Thank you. <laughs> Greg, we as well, Landmarks as well, has our short list of thank yous. The first of which, of course, is to you. Uh, as a small token of our appreciation, we're presenting you with a signed copy of uh, the volume that we published last year, Gateway to New Orleans. Uh, it's a wonderful book. If you haven't obtained your copy yet, please do so. We have it for sale in the back. This, I've said before, and I'll say it again, I think it was the premier publication during the tricentennial year for our city. Uh, and it, it, it uh, chronicles the early years, the, the pre-founding years, if you will, mm -hmm. from 1708 to 1718, and the importance of Bayou St. John during those years. Uh, with full appreciation for what you've done tonight, uh, we present Thank you that so to much. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.